The Star Wars Expanded Universe. What is the Expanded Universe? And more importantly, why is there so much hatred and controversy surrounding the Expanded Universe these days? And why do some people want the Expanded Universe to be continued? Hello, I'm Tad Larkin, host of the YouTube channel Mandalore. Right now you're watching my secondary channel, Captain Fordo, and I'm here to talk about the Star Wars Expanded Universe and the Give Us Legends movement. In this video, I'm going to address common misconceptions with the Expanded Universe and the Expanded Universe movement to hopefully shed some light and enlighten those who are either less informed or those who are more privy to the anti-Legends slash EU propaganda floating around these days, as well as popular YouTubers and clickbait articles taking advantage of the status quo for views. As a little introduction, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Star Wars franchise had an ongoing continuity in the form of novels, comic books, video games, and even a few TV shows that were published from 1978 to 2012. These media would be collectively known as the Expanded Universe from that time, and was part of an overall continuity that expanded upon what would become six films going as far back as 100,000 years before Star Wars A New Hope and 140 years after, and all of it was requisitioned by, approved by, and officially licensed by George Lucas, the creator of this brilliant universe we know as Star Wars. Two years after the Disney Corporation purchased the Star Wars franchise for $4.05 billion, they announced, to the dismay of many, that 37 years of comics, novels, video games, and TV shows would no longer be considered canon by the new Lucasfilm leadership in order to give creative freedom to the new content creators as well as ease their fears that the more casual fans and the new fans of the franchise would have a harder time getting involved in a continuity already nearly 40 years in the making. This old canon would be rebranded as Legends, so that they could continue to sell this media without the fans being confused, slapping a giant golden Legends banner on the books and comics still in a marketing cycle, and some of which that were remarketed, like the Thrawn trilogy for example. Instead of treating this Legends brand as a separate but equal continuity or timeline, allowing at least novel authors to continue publishing Legends content, Lucasfilm instead turned a blind eye towards it, leaving Legends a now untapped market to collect dust, with many disenfranchised fans who had long followed the expanded universe left to wonder if their stories would ever be continued, or if they would end up being forced to assimilate, relearn their Star Wars lore all over again, and watch films they may not even end up liking. Of course there was fan backlash. Star Wars wasn't like Marvel or DC, with multiple timelines and continuity reboots every number of years. Star Wars, until that point, was one timeline, and one continuity, that had survived nearly 40 years without a reboot, and these fans were forced to abandon the story that they had followed for over three decades, and blindly accept whatever comes out of Lucasfilm as canon. So now, this creates a climate within the Star Wars fandom of three divided sides, those of whom who love everything that's coming out of Lucasfilm these days, those who aren't happy with what's coming out of Lucasfilm these days, and the Legends fans who don't care about the new canon at all and just want more books and comics to read within their no longer continued continuity. As a side note and minor disclaimer, I'm generalizing here. Of course there are fans who love both the new canon and the old canon equally. There are some that like the new canon more but still have a healthy respect for the old canon, and vice versa. I'm going to go a bit more into the fandom later, however, just keep this in the back of your mind for now. And of course, everyone picks on the Legends fans. And the messed up thing is that Lucasfilm itself is doing a lot of the bullying of these fans. Pablo Hidalgo, current member of the Lucasfilm Story Group and the man who wrote the Essential Readers Companion, which was an expanded universe guidebook, has been seen bashing these EU fans more than once through his Twitter feed. What's more, Lucasfilm does everything it can at every turn to try and delegitimize the expanded universe, with, for example, several company higher-ups spreading lies that the expanded universe was never canon. Many of those individuals who can be directly quoted before 2014 saying otherwise, as you will surely see in this video. 
That, coupled with other crazy myths and rumors that I'm about to debunk here, have been spreading like wildfire over the years, creating this highly undeserved hatred towards Star Wars Legends and the Legends fans that Lucasfilm has not only inadvertently created, but facilitated by allowing the behaviors of people like Pablo Hidalgo and Ryan Johnson to go unpunished. Meanwhile, ironically preaching against bullying and the toxic fandom. The toxic fandom that, once again, they inadvertently created. Created. By letting Hidalgo bully Legends fans and Johnson demonize anybody who didn't like Last Jedi, they're basically saying, yes, this is okay to bully Legends fans. Yes, this is okay to demonize people who didn't like Last Jedi, because they're not Star Wars fans anyways. This is the example Lucasfilm is setting, whether they mean to or not. So now that you're up to speed with what the Expanded Universe slash Legends is and have a glimpse into the general state of the Star Wars fandom, I can from here go through all the major misconceptions about the Expanded Universe and the Give Us Legends movement in an attempt to set the record straight once and for all. I thought we could start with the big misconception, the elephant in the room, if you will. That misconception being that the Expanded Universe was never canon to begin with. As a longtime Star Wars fan, it is nothing short of baffling to me how anyone could possibly believe this fallacy, considering that the Expanded Universe was everywhere I looked while I was growing up. I was introduced to the Star Wars movies at the age of six, which, at the time, was just the original trilogy, and the Expanded Universe at the age of eight, with a trip to the Scholastic Book Fair and the young Boba Fett books in my hand, it's been love ever since. My parents got me a subscription to Star Wars Insider, the official Star Wars magazine, and anyone who's ever read an issue of Star Wars Insider back in the day knows that the magazine was chock full of short stories and articles containing and explaining a plethora of EU content. There was even a column in each Star Wars Insider issue called Q&A, where you could write into Pablo Hidalgo, the man who today is going around saying that the EU is never canon and bullying EU fans, and he would answer your questions, often using examples from the Expanded Universe if applicable. Let's take this question for example. In Star Wars Insider, issue 70, published in 2003, somebody asks, In Return of the Jedi, why is there no reaction from Leia that Darth Vader is her father? She seemed to be more concerned about Luke leaving. How did she feel about the fact that the man who tortured her and blew up her, own, her home planet is her father? To which Pablo writes back, Leia is a tough nut to crack. You saw how she took the annihilation of her planet standing up. The style of the original trilogy is meant to mimic the serials of old, where characters didn't waste too much time on screen blubbering hysterically about tragedies that had befallen them. It's kind of it's that kind of breeziness that makes these films off putting to the uninitiated, but we Star Wars fans know better. Furthermore, much of Leia's stability comes from the fact that, at the time, she has the real image of her father. It's Bail Organa. Sure, she realizes the truth that Luke told her. She realizes the truth that Luke told her. But the reality of Bail Organa raising her is impossible for her to shake. Luke had no such reality to cling to. He had fanciful notions of his father either being a navigator on a spice freighter or a Jedi friend to Obi-Wan. Vader's revelation hit him much harder. I recommend you pick up The Truce at Baccarat by Kathy Tayers and Tatooine Ghost by Troy Denning. Together, these two books examine Leia's coming to terms with her heritage. It wasn't an easy path. She had to understand and forgive her biological father before she could ever feel comfortable embracing her Jedi roots and raising children of her own. Or this one from Star Wars Insider issue 81. This person asks, Mara Jade and Luke Skywalker were married seven years before the Yuuzhan Vong invasion. So, why isn't Mara mentioned in the Young Jedi Knights and Junior Jedi Knights series? To which Pablo writes back, That was done to save the surprise for the books, in which Luke and Mara finally decide to tie the knot, namely the Hand of Thrawn duology by Timothy Zahn. When the Young Jedi Knight novels were written, authors Kevin J. Anderson and Rebecca Mosta, as well as the editors at Lucas Books, knew that Mara and Luke were destined for each other, but the publishing program back then was all over the timeline. Unlike the New Jedi Order novels out now, books back then did not always follow sequentially in the timeline. This did allow for more varied settings, but also resulted in some hiccups, the marriage of Mara and Luke being a perfect example. The Young Jedi Knights books didn't start coming out until 1995. 
the Hand of Thrawn books which preceded them started in 1997. Since their storylines were not directly contradicted, no, since their storylines were not directly connected, it wasn't really a problem. But no one mentions Luke and Mara's marriage. In fact, Mara seems to be running a lot of off-world errands to keep you to keep from revealing that development. You'll note that there's nothing in the new, in the Young Jedi Knight novels that specifically contradicts the notion that they're married. It's just no one thinks to bring it up. As another note, their actual marriage ceremony wasn't depicted until the comic series Union, which started in 1999. Now, for a guy that claims that the EU was never canon, he sure is using a lot of EU material to back up his answers to these fans' questions. On StarWars.com, you had the Data Bank, which contained articles about different characters, vehicles, alien species, weapons, and organizations, a lot of which were EU and could be accessed by any Star Wars fan who wanted to know more about their favorite universe. From 2004 to 2011, Hyperspace.com was the official Star Wars fan club and even came with a free subscription to Star Wars Insider. Like Insider, there were a lot of EU short stories that you couldn't get in other publishing media, as well as behind-the-scenes stuff while Revenge of the Sith was being made, and you could even watch the original Clone Wars series on there if you missed it on Cartoon Network on Friday nights. All of these officially licensed and sanctioned magazines and websites, all affiliated with Lucasfilm and operated by Lucasfilm staff, recognized these books comics, video games, and TV shows of the Expanded Universe as irrevocably and absolutely canon, and the evidence of it was everywhere if you were a Star Wars fan in between the years 1990 and 2014. So, it is unfathomable to me why so many who were fans of the franchise and had access to this media from 1990 to 2014 and had the EU in their face the entire time believe this nonsense about the EU never being canon. The evidence was everywhere! Before I get into using official documented evidence to back up my claim that the EU was always canon before 2014, I want to take a step back and look at the broader picture, going back to 2014, with one simple question. Answer me this question. If the Expanded Universe was never canon to begin with, then why did Lucasfilm have to release a statement announcing that it is no longer canon? The fact that they had to come out and say, the Expanded Universe is no longer canon, should be irrefutable evidence in of itself that the EU was at one point canon. It's in that statement! Otherwise, why would they need to come out and say, oh yeah, this thing that was never canon, still isn't canon. It would be a waste of breath. We'll start this quote fest with a little blurb from the introduction of Splinter of the Mind's Eye, arguably the first proper expanded universe novel. George Lucas himself wrote this introduction for the 1997 re-release of this novel. After Star Wars was released, it became apparent to me that my story, however many films it took to tell, was only one of thousands that could be told about the characters who inhabit this galaxy. But these were not stories that I was destined to tell. Instead, they would spring from the imagination of other writers, inspired by the glimpse of the galaxy that Star Wars provided. Today, it is an amazing, if unexpected, legacy of Star Wars that so many gifted writers are contributing new stories to the saga. Another novel introduction, this one from Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire, confirms the canon status of this expanded universe novel. Now, for the first time, Lucasfilm LTD, producer of the Star Wars movies, has authorized the continuation of this beloved story. This next quote is a bit more recent from Howard Rothman, who was Executive Vice President of Franchise Management in a 2008 StarWars.com article. We've stuck to a very clear branding strategy for the past decade. This is Star Wars. Individual movies come and go, as do video games, TV shows, and books. They all contribute to the lore of Star Wars, but in the end, it is one saga. And that saga is called Star Wars. We wanted to send a clear message that everything we do is part of that overall saga. Another Rothman quote, this one from a 2008 article on TheWire.com, We set parameters. It had to be an important extension of the continuity, and it had to have internal integrity with the events portrayed in the films. Closely tending to the canon was paying off with the fans. 
Here's Sue Rostoni. I'll discuss her role in the company later. With Alan Kausch in a 1997 Star Wars Insider article. Gossipal, or canon as we refer to it, includes screenplays, films, the radio dramas, and the novelizations. These works are spun out of George Lucas's original stories. The rest are created by other writers. However, between us, we've read everything, and much of it is taken into account in the overall continuity. Let's visit our old pal Leland Chi here, Keeper of the Holocron. In a 2003 article on StarWars.com, Mr. Chi is quoted saying, Lucasfilm canon refers to anything published by the Lucas companies, whether it be movies, books, games, or internet. If you didn't know, back in the day, Leland Chi was the continuity database administrator in the early 2000s, and his job was to essentially keep track of the Star Wars continuity as a whole, and at times, advise authors and content creators so that story decisions don't conflict with the established canon at the time. So for this guy, today, to say that the EU was never canon, after we have clear, documented evidence of he himself saying that the EU was absolutely canon years ago, makes one wonder, just how much is the mouse paying him and others to say this stuff? Keeping with the Leela and Chi theme, here's a tweet from our Holocron Keeper in 2009. The Holocron Keeper does not support the notion of a parallel Star Wars universe, referencing his professional belief that the EU is part of the Star Wars saga, rather than some parallel universe, keeping with Rothman's direction. Star Wars Insider, Issue 101, May 2008, article title, The Essential Expanded Universe. The Expanded Universe is official. Star Wars Year by Year, a visual history written by Daniel Wallace, who is one of my favorite Star Wars reference book writers, had this to say about the Star Wars Encyclopedia written in 2010. The definitive reference book of its time, it collects all the elements introduced into the Star Wars canon by two decades of expanded universe publishing. All of these people that I quoted above, their job was to maintain the expanded universe as directed by George Lucas and keep everything consistent within the overarching canon. Now, why some of these people are saying the EU was never canon today? I have no clue. Is it because they regret throwing out nearly 40 years of stories and don't feel confident enough in their new story, so they have to bash the expanded universe and lie that it was never canon? Maybe. I don't know. Is it them just trying to ease the fan backlash from their unwise decision to decanonize it by saying that it was never canon to begin with? Again, maybe, but I really just don't know. The fact of the matter is, I have them quoted right here saying it was canon at the time, and you can throw Twitter screenshots saying otherwise at me all you want, but it's all here. Officially quoted statements in published articles and novel introductions. You cannot change that fact. It was canon. That's definitive fact. Arguing about it at this point is like arguing against gravity. Next big misconception and counter-argument that the anti-EU-slash-Legends people like to throw around is that George Lucas never considered the Expanded Universe canon. More specifically, it's this exact quote that they throw around. There's my world, which is the movies, and there's this other world that has been created, which is the parallel universe, the licensing world of books, games, and comic books. The anti-EU slash Legends people see the word parallel and immediately think that parallel means separate, therefore the EU was an alternate universe and doesn't matter. Let's take a second to analyze the word parallel. Being a CAD draftsman by profession with a background in architecture and engineering, when I think of parallel, I see two lines, side by side, always equidistant from one another, not intruding on one another, but still projecting toward the same endpoint. And this is analogous to what George is actually saying here. He's saying that the books, comics, and TV shows work in tandem with his universe and don't intrude on it, his universe being the six Star Wars films. He even goes on to explain, they don't intrude on my world, which is a select period in time, but they do intrude between the movies. And this is why George did not allow Expanded Universe authors to publish media taking place in the prequel era before he even had a chance to make the prequels in the early 90s. 
Even if George Lucas had come out and directly said, Yeah, that stuff? Oh, that was never canon. I just authorized those officially licensed books, comics, video games, and TV shows because I want more money and don't care about world building at all. <sighs> the fact of the matter is, he is no longer involved in the franchise anymore, and whatever his feelings were, don't matter anymore. I'm thoroughly confused as to why fans of the new canon use this to attack the EU, as if it justifies the new canon's existence, when George Lucas isn't even involved with their canon at all. Disney threw out his story treatments for Episode 7, and threw out 37 years of continuity based on his approval and guidance, as I'll explain later. The same people who are going around saying that the Expanded Universe wasn't part of George's vision are the same people that bash the prequel trilogy and hate on Lucas for the special edition edits, so I find it a bit hypocritical of them to pull this out when talking about the Expanded Universe. They only agree with George Lucas's vision when it suits their misguided interpretation of the franchise. I personally don't care if he never at all considered the EU canon. Star Wars isn't his anymore, and I'm of the persuasion that Star Wars stopped being his the moment he authorized the creation of the Expanded Universe. If he wanted to expand on his universe himself in his and only his vision, he would have done what J.R.R. Tolkien or George R.R. R. Martin did, and write all the background stories, histories, and map out the galaxy himself. However, since he is the creator of Star Wars itself, and his word, after all, does hold a lot of weight, I'm going to delve further into his relationship with the Expanded Universe, and his involvement in it for your benefit. This leads us into another misconception, that George had no involvement with the Expanded Universe, and as you're about to witness, that's also a fallacy. This kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, about the EU not necessarily being his Star Wars, but Star Wars nonetheless. In a 2004 interview with Sue Ross Stoney, who, until 2011, was the lead licensing managing editor at Lucasfilm, she explained the nature of George Lucas and his attitude when it came to the comics. He knows the comics very well after the fact. He reads the comics. George knows more about Star Wars than we do. He doesn't see the expanded universe as his Star Wars, but as ours. Rostoni's job was to basically manage all the printed material, i.e. the books and comics, and make sure they don't contradict one another and flow well continuity-wise. She often acted as a go-between for George Lucas and the authors, and as this 2002 issue of Star Wars Insider proves, it was her and Lucas together who decided that the EU should have a consistent continuity that should be kept track of. The two of them decided that to maintain quality, it would be crucial to monitor the storylines of all projects to ensure that none of their books contradicted one another. This continuity decision became one of the department's biggest challenges and greatest successes. One thing that people don't understand is that everything had to go through George Lucas, and I mean everything. The authors would have to send him checklists of important story elements in their novels that he had to personally check off if it was okay or not okay, as revealed in this 1997 article in The New Yorker titled, Why the Force is Still With Us. New developments in even the remotest corners of the Star Wars universe are always approved by Lucas himself. Continuity editors send him checklists of potential events, and Lucas checks yes or no. Let's take a step back to 2008 with a fan favorite, Star Wars The Force Unleashed. You'd be surprised by how involved George actually was with the project. According to Leland Chi in an interview on TheWire.com, Lucas approves of every addition to the canon. The ambitious story beats contained in the new game, The Force Unleashed, were permitted only after he signed off, and spent hours talking to the developers about the relationship between Darth Vader and the Emperor. Some, some we were more intrigued with than others, but nonetheless, we really wanted to get input from George. He laid out that there were things that you had to hit uh, in a Star Wars story, that you had to have adventure, that you had to have humor. And then we show him the next, the next presentation is this Wookiee game, and he looks at it and he goes, so I just spent 45 minutes talking to you about the importance of drama, and you present me a game concept where the main character doesn't talk. So he, he wasn't a big fan of the Wookiee game, but he understood what we were going for in terms of a superhero type character in the Star Wars universe. George is all about you know fundamental gameplay, and so immediately when he saw that, that was, that was what we were gonna do. He allowed us to give 
Darth Vader, A Secret Apprentice, which from a canon standpoint is just fantastic. It is such a rich character opportunity. Um, he's got a great love interest in, in Juno Eclipse, so it's not just blowing things up and, and unleashing the force on everyone, it's the consequences of those actions as seen through the eyes of Juno. So that gives an emotional weight uh, that's crucial to delivering a, a Star Wars experience. That, those are elements that the George always made sure we were hitting, and if we came up short on one of them, he didn't hesitate in pointing them out. We could bounce ideas off of him. He could tell us, nah, I wouldn't go there, but did you ever think about this? Or, hey, why don't you create this new character, which was fantastic, because all of a sudden that opened up the canon for us. That video was incredibly important because it got all of us excited about, yeah, this is something that's gonna be a great game. We were able to show it to George, and he was, yep, that's it, go make that. But as Hayden likes to point out, the scary part was, once he said yes, oh my God, we had to go deliver on that. And that's what we've been doing the last couple of years. Star Wars story. It is a rich, deep Star Wars story that fits right in the continuity between episode three and episode four. Because of George's schedule, we had to actually put the story in the outline in a memo form to George. It was a day when, you know, we heard that the fax was coming and everybody rushed around the fax machine. We just stood there looking at the fax machine, waiting for it to come out. And the pages start coming through and then the machine jammed and we're like, ah, you know, running to get new paper and fix it. And, and, and you know, so we actually have this great crumpled fax that, that came through that we, you know, got in, in, and put together. And you could immediately see that he had checked off basically, yes, 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 all the way through, added a couple of great comments. Bail Organa did this, and Leia was doing this, and it's like, oh my god, you know, this is the absolute source material for this great saga. Uh, for me, it was awesome to be able to take that fax in hand and go back to the team who had worked so hard on this, you know, for over a year, and be able to say, this is it, guys. This is our story, this is our character, this is the use of the force that we're, we're championing. Let's go, let's, you know, let's hit the ground and, and make this game. So if this is true, then some of the more ambitious aspects, as Chi put it, that the anti-EU slash legends people like to point out as ridiculous, such as Darth Vader having a secret apprentice, the over-the-top force abilities, the survival of certain Jedi past Order 66, and the creation of the Rebel Alliance were all signed off on and approved by George Lucas, thus counted as official canon in its day. On the subtopic of ambitious or ridiculous things in the EU that actually turned out being approved by George Lucas, one such EU theme that anti-EU folks like to throw around is the reborn Emperor Palpatine from the Dark Empire comics. Tom Veitch, writer for the Dark Empire comics, revealed in a recent Facebook post that it was the original idea of the writers to bring back Vader, not Palpatine, as an imposter wearing Vader's armor, pretending to be him to reunite the Empire. George, however, wasn't a fan of the idea, and told them that if they could find a way to bring the Emperor back, they had his blessing. Luckily for them, Timothy Zahn had already introduced the concept of cloning in the Thrawn trilogy, and George had approved of the idea of Palpatine being able to transfer his Force essence, so it ended up working. You can continue to denounce the idea as not making sense. However, given what we learned about Palpatine and his former master Darth Plagueis in Revenge of the Sith, the concept of Palpatine seeking immortality by transferring his Force essence no longer seems entirely far-fetched, and we can even see several other Sith attempt to do this in the EU. Speaking of Revenge of the Sith, when George made the prequel films, he included a plethora of expanded universe references, the major ones I will list here. In Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace were first introduced to the planet Coruscant. However, it wasn't originally going to be named Coruscant. George's original scripts for Return of the Jedi had the Imperial Capital World named Had Abaddon. However, to keep consistency, the name Coruscant was adopted for the Republic's capital, as first named in Heir to the Empire. Double-bladed lightsabers first appeared in the Tales of the Jedi comics in the late 1990s, being wielded by the Sith Lord Exar Kun, and Darth Maul famously wields a double-bladed lightsaber in Phantom Menace. In Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones, we see a few Jedi characters in the background of numerous scenes, one of which being the blue Twi'lek Aayla Sakura, who first appeared in the Star Wars Republic comics. This next one's more of an easter egg. In the Outlander Club, if you look at the TVs in the background, you can see game footage from Star Wars Episode I Racer. 
These next few references from Revenge of the Sith are a bit tricky, as they are mostly tied into the media within the Clone Wars Multimedia Project, a three-year project to cover the three years in between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, with comics, books, video games, and the original Clone Wars series, to which George Lucas was involved in, as I will explain later. In Revenge of the Sith, after the Battle of Coruscant, Anakin and Obi-Wan are conversing about how many times Anakin has saved him up until this point, to which Obi-Wan replies, ninth time. That business on Kato Nemoidia doesn't count. This is a direct reference to the opening chapters of the New York Times bestseller, Labyrinth of Evil, by James Luceno. Later in the film, Obi-Wan is filling Anakin in on reports that he missed on the Outer Rim sieges, which he explains, Salute Kamai has fallen, and Master Voss has moved his troops to Boz Pity. This sentence contains three EU references simultaneously, the first being a reference to the Battle of Salukamai, first depicted in the Star Wars Republic comics. The next is a reference to Quinlan Voss, a Kifar Jedi for also from the Star Wars Republic comics, and Boz Pity, a reference in this case to the last two issues of Star Wars Obsession, which depicted the Battle of Boz Pity. Interesting fact about Quinlan Voss, he was one of George's favorite characters from the comics, so much so that when John Ostrander was planning to kill him off at the end of the Republic series, George stepped in and his fate was changed so that he would survive. Though, no canon comics after this series continued his story, save for Star Wars The Clone Wars and an Infinities comic featuring an elderly Quinlan Voss cameo. Later in the film, when Padme is talking to Anakin about the war, she says, This war represents a failure to listen. We need to stop the fighting and let diplomacy resume. This is an exact verbatim quote from a Jedi named Mira in the comic Star Wars Jedi Mace Windu, released in 2003. Lastly, this is probably just an easter egg, but I thought it was worth mentioning, during the Order 66 scenes, Plo Koon is flying a Delta-7 Jedi Starfighter, painted remarkably similar to Anakin's customized Delta-7 from the original Clone Wars series, as well as the Republic comics. Getting back to George's involvement with the EU, I thought we'd take a look at my two favorite multimedia projects, the Shadows of the Empire multimedia project and the Clone Wars multimedia project both of which George Lucas was involved in. The novel, junior novel, comics, N64 video game, and radio drama of Star Wars Shadows of the Empire owe their entire existence to George Lucas, as he was involved with the outlining of the project, as Mark Vaz explains in his 1989 book Secrets of Shadows of the Empire. Shadows began as a two-page outline of the basic premise and main characters prepared by Rothman and Lucy Wilson, with George Lucas approving the project's setting within the flow of the original trilogy. Moving on to the Clone Wars multimedia project, as I explained earlier, George Lucas was heavily involved with this multimedia project, in particular, the Star Wars Clone Wars miniseries, which aired on Cartoon Network as well as Hyperspace.com. As Gendy Tartakovsky, producer of Star Wars Clone Wars, explains, he had several interactions with Lucas over the creation of the series, and Gendy made very well sure that George's input and requests were received and acted upon in the show. The two discussed everything from General Grievous to Jedi Knighthood, and it was George's idea to have the last few episodes of the series directly tie in to Revenge of the Sith taking him and the Clone Wars team on a tour of Industrial Light and Magic, where they eventually got to read a rough script for Revenge of the Sith. These next few interviews and audio clips you're about to watch and listen to are from the mini-documentaries Clone Wars Bridging the Saga and Clone Wars Connecting the Dots, as well as snippets from the Clone Wars Volume 2 commentary. Full links to Connecting the Dots and Bridging the Saga are in the description below. However, the commentary I've been unable to track down, so that was directly from my personal DVDs of Volumes 1 and 2 of Star Wars Clone Wars. The Clone Wars are a major event in the history of the Star Wars universe. And uh, obviously because it's a war, there's a lot of action and a lot of adventure and a lot of things going on. But in the films, we don't really get to deal with that very much. We kind of start the Clone War in one episode, we end it in the next episode, but we never actually see the war. Um, and so uh, by doing the animated series, it was a great opportunity to fill in some of the blanks in the middle where you get to deal with the adventures of the war and all the things that went on during the war, because obviously that's a very fertile ground for exciting storytelling. Uh, I get a phone call that George wanted to talk to me, and he had, they had this idea because they wanted to do more, 
but he wanted it to tie in directly into episode three. It seemed like an honor. You know, he, he, he enjoyed the first batch enough to want to be like, hey, let's do some more. And not only that, let's watch you guys animate the opening scrawl, basically. We're like, woohoo! The thing that attracted me to it, it has a slight anime feel to it, and I'm very interested in anime, and I was really interested in moving into a kind of animation that was very different from anything we'd done in the past. And um, India is very good at bridging that transition between traditional animation and anime. Having the opportunity to be involved with the whole Star Wars saga, it's been really cool to actually explore the Clone Wars. Me and my friend Mike Tweed be playing with our action figures and down in the basement, and just you know, dreaming about what were the Clone Wars all about. And then having an opportunity to make some of that gel is really awesome. It's fun that there's so many different little mediums that explore Star Wars and making it a larger universe. And just on a nerd level, it'll be cool to go, yeah, my cartoon connects to that movie. Now you get to go see the movie and then find out how my cartoon ended. The second group of episodes in the animated series leads right up to the events that happen in the film. So we get a little background on what was going on right before episode three. You know, it's a little episode two and a half, but a little one, maybe like 2.3. <laughs> Initially with the, the first series, they originally were supposed to be commercials. Lucasfilm themselves, they decided that they would only be a little longer, so they became longer episodes. But we weren't able to tell a lot of story. It was mostly just action. With the advent of the second series, we actually were able to tell an actual fairly long story. It was more like a movie, like an animated movie. I mean, the thing about doing, doing Star Wars is that it's the story. And the story coming from George, not just something we made up. And now going into this, all of a sudden, it's still Clone Wars, but it's the ending of the Clone Wars. They wanted us to do more of what we had done because it was so successful, but at the same time, they wanted us to actually do the crawl from the opening of the film. So it became more a real part of Star Wars. We had to show Palpatine being kidnapped. We had to have Anakin and Obi-Wan away from the planet and in the Outer Rim territories. The, the look evolved very kind of naturally in order, and we got a lot of photographs and reference for what the new vehicles were going to be in Episode 3, and they were all hybrids between the TIE fighter and between the X-Wing fighter, and you could tell this is the bridging machinery. So we kind of followed along with that, and we made our clone troopers look similar to stormtroopers, and, and everything started to kind of fall into place, and everything's starting to look like A New Hope. What George Lucas always says, it's all about mirrors and uh, kind of like ripples, and the ripples repeat themselves. So we wanted to follow that thing where on Dagobah and Empire Strikes Back, where Luke steps into the cave and he sees Darth Vader and, you know, and whatever vision that gave him. When we first did Grievous in chapter 20, we had very little information about him. He was just being conceived as a main villain for episode three. But for this, we had to really explore him more. And uh, you know, George kind of told me about, he had some thoughts about that he was like a, an old style villain where he fights, but then when he's losing, he runs away. We had a lot, a lot of discussions about lightsabers. How does he know to use lightsabers? Because you know, it's supposed to be like a special gift, and you're supposed to be force sensitive. George kind of told me, about, oh, maybe Kanduku teaches him. How often must I tell you? Control my central line. Good. I've been trained in your Jedi arts by Count Dooku. <laughs> And then we got a call that they wanted to introduce Grievous's cough earlier because our character didn't have it, so we somehow had to maybe link the two together better. And so eventually we ended up doing a little sequence at the maybe two weeks before we had to deliver of Mace going out and crushing Grievous's chest, and that but that's what gives us the connection that all of a sudden he starts coughing. <coughs> the one thing they really wanted to do is just draw Wookiees. As soon as we got approval that we could do something on Kashyyyk, we did. It's very exciting to have been able to add a little bit to that mythology that sparked my imagination as a kid. Clone Wars. So one of the first things that we started doing for this new set is George definitely wanted to finish the story that we set up in episode 20 from the last season. Isn't there a story from ILM? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we went up to get a, like a kind of tour of ILM and Rob Coleman was there who was the supervising animator for the Star Wars movies. And he was telling us, thanks guys, you guys you know, had created a whole lot of work for us because now George liked what you guys did in the first batch that he made us give all the ARC troopers the skirts. So then they had to wear. go back and re-render all the scenes they had yeah. already finished with skirts and racing stripes. <laughs> thanks, you guys. 
Before we started this, we took a trip to Lucas and we got a chance to read the script for Revenge of the Sith. And I was trying to think back. I had lunch with George before we started this and he kind of told me what he wanted us to do. First thing was to finish the Kiari Mundi story from episode 20. Second was to feature basically the story that he said we should do. Because in, in the beginning, I wasn't really interested in doing it because we were so burnt out from doing the first set of 20. And so he told me that the beginning of Revenge of the Sith is the siege of Coruscant. And he goes, why don't you guys do the kidnapping of Palpatine? And to me, that sounded really exciting because now all of a sudden we're really kind of bridging the two stories together, not just making up our own stories. We're doing the story before the story. So real, it seemed real. real. And he says that Anakin's a Jedi Knight. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm sure you've got specific instructions for the Jedi knighthood because that's such a huge part of you know Star Wars and he goes no just you know <laughs> sorry Wookiees and of course um, and George said we could I don't know if George said or Howard um, they said we can show Wookiees so of course you know we're never going to turn down an opportunity to uh, so we've got Tarkov and young Jacoba uh, you know because I think George hadn't really locked down exactly what he wanted to do with the character for Grievous yeah and what, the way George pitched Grievous to me was that he's kind of one of those old you know B-serial uh, villains where he does something bad and then he you know twirls his mustache and runs off yeah, yeah, yeah. he always escapes <laughs> but before that we had been told that he's like this ruthless totally capable Jedi killer right. so it's like well <laughs> yeah I think he was still kind of working on working it, it out yeah. so uh, what we did is we just had Dooku explain, you know, this is why, and for us, and to also explain to the audience who may have been concerned or wondering after seeing the first batch, like how he could take on these Jedi. It is clearly evident from the previously discussed sources that George Lucas at least considered the expanded universe canon in a tertiary sense, not necessarily on the same level as his six films, but flowing seamlessly into them creating a cohesive world nonetheless. His involvement with the EU projects, his guidance of story creators, and his inclusion of EU elements in the prequels and special editions show that these works by no means strayed away from his vision of the Star Wars galaxy, but worked with his vision to enhance it. What are your hopes for the new Star Wars movies? What is your a new hope for the new Star Wars movies? <laughs> Uh, as, they're, as they clearly are headed to a new franchise? Well, you know, I hope it's successful. I hope they do a great job. They've, you know, the original uh, saga was about the father, the children, and the grandchildren. And you, you, I mean, that's not a secret to anybody. It's even in the novels and everything. But, and the, the children were in their 20s and everything, so it, it wasn't. Next item on the list is the myth that the expanded universe had no continuity, and while I for the most part disagree, I can see where the critics are coming from with this. I will make the argument that the expanded universe did have a consistent continuity. However, I personally feel that towards the end of George Lucas' ownership of the franchise, things became a bit more lax in the continuity department, as I will explain later. Before we get to that, let me first explain what was then considered Star Wars canon, and by doing that, I first need to explain the hierarchy. Within the Star Wars canon at the time was a tier system, which was effectively the levels of canon, or how much canon something was. At the tippy top, we have G canon for George Lucas canon, and this consisted of the six Star Wars films, which were obviously the highest level of canon. Next, you have C canon for continuity canon, which was a majority of the expanded universe. The comics, novels, short stories, radio dramas, TV shows, and certain video games with linear storylines. Below C canon, we have S canon for secondary canon, which was generally reserved for some of the older works before Lucasfilm began cracking down on continuity, that may have some elements of their stories fit within the continuity, but for the most part contradict the established continuity, such as the old Marvel comics. These story elements that do fit within the continuity are often referenced by C canon material. However, the parts of the story that don't fit within the continuity are generally discarded i.e. you should take these works with a grain of salt. 
at the very bottom we have N Cannon, which, you guessed it, is non-canon works. This slot consisted of anything published with the Infinities label, which were usually the satirical Star Wars Tales comics. The Lego Star Wars shorts, Robot Chicken Star Wars, Family Guy Star Wars, Star Wars Angry Birds, and generally anything that is meant to be satirical or not taken seriously, or works that were once canon and have since been decanonized. Now, does this mean that everything went perfectly with one another all the time? For the most part, yes. Especially when you consider the sheer amount of authors and content creators working within this continuity, they did a fantastic job. However, there are a few bumps in that road. That does not mean that these proverbial bumps in the road weren't taken care of, though. It was not uncommon for works to once be canon and then be subsequently decanonized, or retconned, which basically means, yeah, it didn't happen like that, or it required further explanation. A good example of this would be Boba Fett, who was originally thought to be a former stormtrooper that went rogue, according to Dark Empire if I recall correctly. His real name, it was thought, wasn't even Boba Fett, it was Jaster Mareel, and that Boba Fett was his alias. This was retconned with Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones, where we find out that Boba is actually a clone of Jango Fett, another Mandalorian bounty hunter, and instead of turning the EU upside down on its head, authors now had room to develop Boba and Jango even further, and explain these inaccuracies. In the end, it was explained that Boba being a former stormtrooper was a misconception. Seeing that he is a clone, which as we all know, the clone troopers eventually became stormtroopers, though he never served any time with the Empire. It was most likely a story that he made up, or a rumor he perpetuated to protect himself. Jaster Mareel was then explained to be one of his many aliases, as one would have when you're a fringe type working the bounty hunter game. And the meaning behind the name Jaster Mareel was explained even further, where we find out in Django Fett Open Seasons that Django was adopted by a Mandalorian named Jaster Mareel during the Mandalorian Civil War, following the murder of his parents at the hands of the Death Watch, effectively making Jaster Mareel his grandfather, at least by Mandalorian standards. Towards the end of Lucas's ownership of Lucasfilm, we see a new slot in the canon hierarchy open up. T Canon, one step below G Canon, and one step above C Canon, which stands for Television Canon. However, the only TV show actually within this hierarchy slot was Star Wars The Clone Wars, not to be confused with the aforementioned Star Wars Clone Wars. While the official reason for T Canon being created was because of George Lucas's involvement with TCW, despite him actually being involved with every TV show up until that point, the actual reason is so that the writers of Star Wars The Clone Wars could have more quote unquote creative freedom to write their stories in an already oversaturated era of the Star Wars timeline i.e. so that they could do whatever they want with the show, contradicting as much of the established continuity as they want, cherry-picking whichever characters from the established lore as they pleased, with zero repercussions or limitations whatsoever. Sound familiar? It should, because that's basically what Disney did to the entire Star Wars Expanded Universe after the buyout, only this was on a much smaller scale, yet no less damaging. I'm not going to explain how Star Wars The Clone Wars screwed up the Expanded Universe's continuity here. If you're dying to know how, go watch my two videos, Why Star Wars The Clone Wars Doesn't Fit in Legends, and Why Star Wars The Clone Wars Doesn't Fit in Legends Part 2. Links for those videos are in the description. All you really need to know to continue on from here is that the show was written with very little regard to the continuity it was supposed to exist within, creating a plethora of inconsistencies which shook the EU's continuity to its core. Leland Chi, Hidalgo, and several authors and source books, of course, tried to put a band-aid over this stuff with retcons and explanations. However, when you look at them, they make no sense, even from the highly illogical standpoint of Star Wars. So this is why I argue that the Expanded Universe did have consistency and continuity, just not after Star Wars The Clone Wars. If Legends is ever to continue as an alternate universe, I believe that it's imperative that this show be removed from Legends, and exist only within the Disney canon. I'm not going to debate that here, however.
This next misconception is one I see flung around all the time. That being that, the EU was insert arbitrary number percent garbage. I see articles and internet comments all the time saying that the EU was 90% garbage or the EU was 70% garbage, and it's all subjective dribble by people who have never probably even read 100% of the EU, and therefore are automatically incorrect in saying that it was mostly garbage. I mean, you can believe what you want. However, I personally wouldn't bother listening to what some hack writing for Screen Rant or Gizmodo, who probably never even picked up an EU book, comic, or video game in his or her entire life, and is probably paid off by Disney Lucasfilm to say so, tell me that the story I followed for close to two decades was trash. Get real. Despite being purely subjective to one's personal opinions, there's actually quite a bit of evidence to dispute that it was all garbage. Knights of the Old Republic won Game of the Year in 2003. Star Wars Battlefront 2, the original one, remains to be the best-selling Star Wars game of all time, so much so that they even re-released it on Steam with multiplayer support, shortly before the new Battlefront 2's release. A cornucopia of Star Wars novels over the years made it onto the New York Times bestseller list, including Labyrinth of Evil, Fate of the Jedi Apocalypse, Darth Plagueis, Star Wars The Force Unleashed novelization, Republic Commando, Order 66, The Old Republic Deceived, The Old Republic Annihilation, Star Wars Choices of One, Shadows of the Empire, Revenge of the Sith novelization, Heir to the Empire, Dark Force Rising, The Last Command, Vector Prime, and many, many more. On the subject of comics, this is a bit more subjective, as I don't personally know of any awards in the comic book world, but as a guy who owns a lot of the Dark Horse Star Wars comics, I can say that they are quite fantastic, and do a rather well job of tying into the novels, video games, and movies. Now, does this mean that the expanded universe was 100% gold? Of course not. Like with any great epic, story, or tale, there are bits and pieces some people don't like, whether it's just poorly written, not well thought out, or personal preference. I mean, there are even some books that I own that I did not entirely like. I was not a fan of the writing style in Cestus Deception. I found it extremely difficult to read, especially after being spoiled by fantastic writers like Timothy Zahn and Karen Travis. Vision of the Future and Spectre of the Past, though beautifully written by none other than the king of Star Wars novel writing, Timothy Zahn, I found to be dreadfully boring at times, as most of the novels are about political intrigue within the New Republic and Imperial Remnant. The only interesting parts I found were the interactions with Luke and Mara Jade on Nirawan. In the realm of comics, the Tales of the Jedi series, though not bad in terms of writing, story, and characters, I absolutely hate the art style. It just doesn't feel like Star Wars to me. Granted, the artwork does get better the closer you get to the 2000s. The old Marvel comics, however, were trippy as all hell, and while I do like some of the story arcs I've read within the comics, like the stuff with Lord Shadowspawn, Lumaya, and Fen Shisa with the Mandalorians, there's just some really weird stuff that doesn't really seem like it belongs in Star Wars. That being said, new canon fans aren't one to talk, as the Disney canon has its own fair share of cringeworthy moments. Take this passage from Chuck Wendig's Aftermath, for example. The tie wibbles and wobbles in the air, careening drunkenly across the Mirian rooftops as it zigzags, herkily jerkily, out of sight. Herkily jerkily, wibbly wobbly, am I reading a passage from a Star Wars book or a Doctor Who book here? Also, what the actual hell is this? The fan backlash from Last Jedi and the plummeting box office numbers from Solo is enough to convince me, at least, that even a lot of the new canon fans are unhappy with these stories, the biggest complaint I've heard being the handling of Luke's character in Last Jedi. Look, I can sit here and badmouth the Disney canon until I'm blue in the face, based only on information that my friends who do read the new canon relay to me. But the fact of the matter is, I have never picked up a new canon book, nor have I even watched any of the new canon movies. So it is unfair for me to say that 90% of the Disney canon is garbage, just as it is unfair for you to say that 90% of the EU was garbage, when I guarantee you, you haven't even read, watched, or played 50% of the EU, let alone 90 90%. There's just too much of the EU to be consumed in one short time period. Even I, one who claims to be an EU aficionado, haven't even read 90% of the expanded universe. I mean, look at my book collection. 
It's quite pitiful compared to other Legends fans I know. If I, a die-hard Legends fan, haven't even barely scratched the surface of the EU, then how the hell can somebody who's not even interested in the EU at all possibly possess knowledge that surpasses an actual Legends fan? Their lying is the simple conclusion. A majority of my personal interactions with these people haven't much surpassed something along these lines. I read a Star Wars book one time. It was awful. Oh yeah? Which one? I don't even remember. It was that bad. It's all awful. Or my favorite is when you ask them what EU books they've read and they say, I don't have to prove anything to you. Well, you kind of do if you're going to make a bold claim like the EU was 90% garbage. This is the kind of logic we're dealing with. The new canon fans that criticize Legends maybe do attempt to read one Legends book. I'll give them that much benefit of the doubt. And then either make assumptions about the rest of the expanded universe from there, or maybe they hear it from a friend, or they read it in one of those crappy clickbait articles I mentioned earlier. Who knows? But I guarantee you, if they're that anti-EU slash Legends, then they probably haven't read 90% of it as they claim. Am I saying that you need to go out and read every single Legends book, every single Legends comic, every single old Star Wars insider short story, play every single video game, mobile game, or computer game, track down and watch every single Star Wars TV show before 2014, and find all the old radio dramas? Absolutely not. All I'm saying is, unless you've digested 90% of the EU, don't go around saying that 90% of the EU was bad. It's that moronically simple. Sure, you can call me ignorant for not watching the new movies and reading the new books, but at least I'm not running my mouth saying that the Disney canon is 90% garbage. Think of how much of an ignorant prick you might sound if you say the EU was 90% garbage when you've never even picked up a Legends novel in your life. It's the same damn thing. That's what I'm trying to convey here. This next misconception kind of falls under the umbrella of the EU being considered 90% garbage. Remember those clickbait articles I mentioned earlier, perpetuating this fantastically misguided idea that the EU was bad? Well, the most popular of these articles is Gizmodo's 12 Dumbest Things from the Star Wars Expanded Universe. That's right, we're gonna talk about Skippy. You see, if these so-called journalists... <coughs> hacks... <coughs> actually did any research past whatever agenda they're trying to push, they would know that Skippy the Force-sensitive droid was never actually part of the Expanded Universe, or the Star Wars canon at all as a matter of fact. If you recall, back to earlier in the video when I was explaining the canon hierarchy, the bottom of the totem pole is reserved for non-canon works. These being anything with the Star Wars Infinity symbol, which for the most part was the Star Wars Tales comics. Most of these comics were purely non-canon, and were comprised of every kind of story from fun what-if scenarios to full-on comedic and satirical material, not at all meant to be taken seriously. But because some journalist at Gizmodo was either A. too lazy, B. too not caring, or C. falling short of any actual dumb things within the EU to fill his or her quota, didn't do their damn research, now everyone who's gullible enough to believe these tragic excuses for articles thinks that there was once actually a Force-sensitive droid within the official Star Wars continuity. Whether deliberate or not, this is misinformation. The Infinity's comics were never canon, which means Skippy the Force-sensitive droid, along with a plethora of other stories, and yes, Tag and Bink, were never canon to begin with. I'm disheartened that I even need to put this quote up here, seeing that it is, or at least in the case of the brainwashed masses, once was common knowledge. However, I'm going to put this quote up here from Sue Rostoni anyways, to shut up the naysayers. It frustrates me to no end to see this misinformation be used against those who want to see Legends continued as an alternate timeline, and it doesn't help that some of these Tales comics, like Tag and Bink, are being republished with the Legends banner on it, giving the false implication that they were once part of the old canon. Tag and Bink were never canon at all. Stop bragging about including Legends characters in your new movies if they were never Legends to begin with!
Here is a big misconception that I see thrown around quite frequently. That being that, Legends doesn't need its own timeline. They can keep bringing Legends elements into the new canon like they've been doing. In the past five years of the franchise, characters, organizations, vehicles, weapons, etc. from the expanded universe are commonly, quote-unquote, made canon, at least in the eyes of Disney-owned Lucasfilm, by bringing them into a new book, comic, TV show, or movie. There are also some new canon characters that are inspired heavily by Legends characters, such as Jin Erso in Rogue One, who is inspired by Jan Ors from Dark Forces, Kylo Ren or Ben Solo from the sequel trilogy, who is inspired by Jason Solo, Han and Leia's oldest son in Legends, and Kanan Jarrus from Rebels, who is inspired by a mix of Kyle Katarn in Dark Forces and Das Janir from the Dark Times comics. While many approve of the idea of bringing elements from the EU into the Disney canon, I find it a bit backwards, and frankly dishonorable. I mean, their entire claim as to why the EU needed to be decanonized was to give the new content creators more, quote-unquote, creative freedom. And if they're not going to utilize that creative freedom and instead just cherry-pick elements from the EU and bring them into the new canon, it kind of defeats the whole purpose for decanonizing the EU in the first place. Not to mention, bringing Legends characters into the new canon isn't really bringing those characters back. They're still a totally different character. It's what the characters went through that defines them, and if you just take a character's name and vague appearance from the Legends timeline and plop them into a whole different universe, essentially, with different laws and rules that govern how that universe operates from Legends, it's not the same character. Just a different character with the same name and appearance. That's the crux of my problem. Luke would never say that. I'm sorry. Well, in this version, see, I'm talking about this, the George Lucas Star Wars. This is the next generation of Star Wars. So I almost had to think of Luke as another character. Uh, maybe he's Jake Skywalker. He's not my Luke Skywalker. But I had to do what Ryan wanted me to do because it, it serves the story well. But uh, listen, I still haven't accepted it completely. But it's only a movie. I For example... Grand Admiral Thrawn in Star Wars Rebels is not the same as Grand Admiral Thrawn from Star Wars Heir to the Empire. Yes, they may look similar, albeit with a few minor differences like the fact that new canon Thrawn has pupils when original Thrawn did not, and some minor uniform discrepancies, but they did not go through the same character building events that make them who they are. Yes, both Thrawns study art to learn about their enemies. Yes, both Thrawns are master tacticians. Yes, both Thrawns are of the Chiss species, and both came from years of serving in the Chiss Ascendancy. But, they were found by Palpatine in different ways, went through different events, trials, and tribulations to get to where they had to be, and their military careers peaked at different times of galactic history. Legends Grand Admiral Thrawn was found by Palpatine during the events of the Outbound Flight Project, a Jedi-led attempt to explore the Unknown Regions about five years before the Clone Wars, while Disney canon Thrawn first appears during the Clone Wars. Legends Grand Admiral Thrawn faced much adversity in the Imperial Court due to him being a non-human, and because of this, found himself on duty in the Unknown Regions for much of Emperor Palpatine's rule, only resurfacing four years after the Emperor's death at Endor, uniting the fragmented squabbling warlords of the former Empire under his leadership against the New Republic. While new canon Grand Admiral Thrawn has the height of his military career during Palpatine's rule, and is put out of action before the Battle of Endor and the Emperor's death even take place. New canon Grand Admiral Thrawn is trained in martial arts. Legends Thrawn relies on his superior intellect and no gree bodyguards to thwart his enemies. What I'm trying to say here is that new canon Thrawn is only a mere glimpse into the essence of what the original Thrawn character actually is, but fundamentally is not Thrawn for all intents and purposes, just a being with the same name and vague appearance living in a parallel universe. 
Timothy Zahn, being the man who created Thrawn for Star Wars under Lucas's leadership, naturally is able to capture Thrawn really well in the new canon novels Thrawn and Thrawn Alliances, just as Dave Filoni came close enough when trying to portray the character in Star Wars Rebels. But again, the new canon Thrawn isn't the same as the original Thrawn, no matter how similar they try to make them. Their experiences and the universes they live in are just too dissimilar, and like I said, it's experiences that make the character. Same goes if they brought Mara Jade, a former Emperor's Hand who was tasked to kill Luke Skywalker but ended up falling in love with him and marrying him, into the new canon. Yes, they could give her the same name and appearance. Yes, they could have her as an Emperor's Hand. Hell, maybe they could even find a way to have her marry Luke before the events that lead up to Force Awakens and Last Jedi. But they would still have her go through different events and have her interact with different characters to get her to that point. And even if they managed to capture a tiny glimpse of her essence, it still wouldn't be the real Mara Jade, just some mirrored off-brand character. You can convince yourself as much as you wish that these characters and elements are fully back, but that won't change the fact that they are only a mere shadow of what they were in the Legends timeline. The only way we can truly have these characters and elements back and have more stories written about them, and not just the off-brand Disney versions of them, is to have Legends continued as an alternate, equally valid timeline. This misconception is a bit more specific, however, it's one that I see tossed around quite a lot. That being, the Knights of the Old Republic games are still canon, and those are the only EU stories I care about. Unfortunately, Knights of the Old Republic, Knights of the Old Republic 2, The Old Republic, and the affiliated books and comics that tie into the games are not considered canon by present-day Lucasfilm. If we take a simple trip to the Wikipedia pages of the characters and events portrayed in the games, the lack of a canon tab on the article is conclusive enough to confirm that the games are no longer canon. And, not to mention, the books and comics being reproduced are done so with the Legends label emblazoned on them. The Old Republic MMO, in fact, is the only Star Wars medium left that still produces new Legends stories in the post-2014 franchise. The first new canon Star Wars book, Tarkin, by James Luceno, effectively wrote out the possibility of the KOTOR games being brought into the new canon when it established that the hyperdrive was only invented 1,000 years before Star Wars A New Hope, and that the Republic was established in 1032 BBY, while the KOTOR games take place over 3,000 years before A New Hope, which would make space travel and the existence of the Republic in the game impossible. The recent additions of Revan, Bastilla Shan, Jolie Bindo, and other characters from the KOTOR games in the popular mobile game Galaxy of Heroes were advertised as new Legends heroes. So this is yet another reason to support Legends being its own official alternate timeline if you're a fan of the KOTOR games and want to possibly see more of them. I have just a couple more quick debunks to go through before I start talking about the Give Us Legends movement. These ones are easy. The Star Wars Expanded Universe was too big to follow. While that sounds like a good excuse to not try the Expanded Universe for yourself, it's rooted in nothing but laziness, I'm afraid. Straight from Bantam Books, Lucasfilm and Bantam decided that the future novels in the series would be interconnected. That is, events in one novel would have consequences in the others. You might say that each Bantam Star Wars novel, enjoyable on its own, is also part of a larger tale. This one is from a May 2008 Star Wars Insider article, The Essential Expanded Universe. Yet, even the biggest fan can be forgiven for wincing when asked to catch up on 30 years of backlogged fiction. Fortunately, the Expanded Universe is like a salad bar. You don't have to eat the whole thing. 
Or you can just take it from me, who actually reads the Expanded Universe. All you really have to do is just pick a novel or a comic that looks interesting to you. A lot of them are enjoyable on their own. Some of them are part of a novel series, but they make it really easy to find whichever book is first in the series. There's even a timeline on the inside cover of each book that tells you when all the books take place, and suggests other books that you might like. It's really easy to get into if you have the right mindset. Last Expanded Universe misconception I'm going to cover here, a Star Wars reboot was necessary to maintain continuity. Well, take it from Holocron Keeper Leland Chi himself. In the end, my ongoing vision is that as long as the Holocron exists, Star Wars will not reboot. StarWars.com, July 20th, 2012. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you're forced to hand the holocron over to Disney. Because, as much as Lucasfilm is involved, in the end, Disney is calling all of the major shots. As this November article in Fortune magazine, Disney Will Protect Star Wars, states, We, Disney, have unfettered rights to Star Wars and Lucasfilm's other properties going forwards. We have complete creative control over the name of the movie, how it's made, and what's in it. So now, for this last portion of the video, I'm going to switch gears here and talk about the Give Us Legends movement, a group of dedicated fans who just want their Star Wars continued. As a disclaimer here, while I consider myself an advocate of the Give Us Legends movement, I am not one of the founders or higher-ups, and therefore do not legally represent the Give Us Legends movement in any way, shape, or form. The information that I divulge here is based only from what I've read in official statements from the higher-ups and seen from my interactions within the fandom. No names are given to protect the privacy of individuals. The first misconception about the Give Us Legends movement is that they want to overthrow Disney, decanonize the new canon, and bring Star Wars back to the way it was. This couldn't be more false. Literally, all we want is to have Legends continued as an alternate, let me reiterate, alternate, yet equally valid Star Wars timeline, and have new content published within that timeline, continuing our favorite stories that were abruptly discontinued. In the five years that the new canon has been around, it has grown larger than the expanded universe was after ten years into its existence. So to call for the new canon to be decanonized now would just be counterproductive. And not to mention, we don't want fans of the new canon to have their stories discontinued like ours were. It's not fair. We have a unique opportunity here for everyone to be happy, but Disney Lucasfilm is so stubborn that they fail to realize the potential of continuing Legends as an alternate, equally valid timeline. This is an opportunity to have their cake and eat it too, but there's only so much as fans we can do. We really aren't asking for much. We're not asking for feature-length Legends films. We're not asking for Legends TV shows. Hell! We aren't even asking for Legends video games and comics, which would be nice. All we really want are books, simple books from our favorite authors, many of whom have confirmed they would be interested in returning to writing within the Legends continuity if allowed to do so by Disney Lucasfilm. That's all. The next misconception about the Give Us Legends movement is they're all trolls and bullies. They bullied Kelly Marie Tran. Wrong again. You see, the definition of a troll seems to have changed a lot from when I first started using the internet. Back then, a troll was just somebody who got their jollies out of riling people up. Nowadays, the term has become a synonym for anybody who doesn't agree with your opinion or views, even if they're serious. For example, Ryan Johnson calling everybody who didn't like The Last Jedi trolls. If your opinion is that the EU was never canon, the EU was 90% garbage, the EU had no continuity, and that George Lucas had no involvement in the EU, then I guess we are trolls by modern standards, because we know otherwise with documented evidence to back it up. But in all seriousness, the Give Us Legends movement has done no trolling whatsoever. 
During the Kelly Marie Tran Instagram scandal in June of this year, the blame was put on those of the Give Us Legends movement for bullying her off Instagram by an unaffiliated group, who I shall not name here because naming them will give them attention and you should never give attention to trolls, claiming to have affiliation with the Give Us Legends movement by using the common hashtag, hashtag Give Us Legends, that is synonymous with those within the movement. Just a little inside scoop here, if you see a group that starts with I don't know, down with Disney or anti-Disney, it's most likely a troll group, none of which are affiliated with Give Us Legends. They did this to hurt the Give Us Legends movement's credibility, and turn the seething hatred of the new canon fans as well as the casual fandom on the wrong people. Official statements by the Give Us Legends movement and the Twin Suns Foundation came out soon after, denying any involvement with the scandal and private correspondence with the troll group by individuals confirmed that it was a power play to attempt to hurt Give Us Legends movement's credibility and visage within the public eye. On June 9th, the official Give Us Legends movement Facebook page posted, The rumors about this page being involved in the harassment of a Lucasfilm employee are false. We do not and have never condoned such behavior, and anyone claiming otherwise is lying. If you wish to read the subsequent comment chain on the post, you're welcome to do so. Link in the description. Press release. In response to accusations that Give Us Legends, the very entity that became the Twin Suns Foundation, was behind an effort to bully and harass a Star Wars actress to the point where she left social media, we wish to make the situation crystal clear. The accusations came about because a certain troll page, which we will not name as we do not wish to give them any more attention than they have already received, claimed to be aligned with us and others within the Expanded Universe movement. Despite a complete lack of proof, certain media entities have picked up the story, and have not bothered to fact-check a word, thus allowing our reputation to be increasingly damaged as these lies filter through various fan groups across the internet. The Twin Suns Foundation board of directors and team members have decided that we need to make it 100% clear where Give Us Legends slash Twin Suns Foundation stands on the issue, and protect our hard-earned reputation. Bullying and harassment have no place in the Star Wars community, from any party, be it fan, media, or otherwise. We have never, and will never, condone such actions, as we have often been a victim of those actions ourselves in the past. Our focus has been getting Star Wars books into children's hospitals, libraries, little free libraries, and other such places where they are needed as often as possible. We also assist the Expanded Universe movement in its efforts to reach the goal of, con of obtaining a continuation of the Star Wars Legends timeline, while also ensuring the continuation of Disney's new Star Wars timeline. Simply stated, the actions we are wrongfully accused of run directly counter, 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 let me reiterate, counter to our stated goals and our past actions. We have always been and will continue to be a POSITIVE force in the Star Wars fandom. We will not, I repeat, we will not allow our name to be slandered with false accusations and libel. The Twin Suns Foundation team. Jason Ward from the website MakingStarWars.net published an article titled The Filth in the Fandom. Give Us Legends group takes credit for Kelly Marie Tran leaving social media, in which he only takes what is said by the group that shall not be named, i.e. the troll group that's actually doing the fucking bullying, and writes the article based on that, not bothering to do any actual fucking journalism, and take into account the official statements by the actual Give Us Legends movement. He only merely writes about the group that shall not be named, condemning the actual Give Us Legends movement, which gave way to a lot of bad press. Brian Borg, founder of the Give Us Legends movement and president of the Twin Suns Foundation, tweeted MakingStarWars.net, As founder of At Give Us Legends and president of the non-profit charity to At Twin Suns that hashtag Give Us Legends became, I can confirm that the page in the story doesn't and has never had anything to do with the Give Us Legends movement or the Alliance to Preserve the Expanded Universe group, which I help administrate. Please correct your story. Thanks. 
To which, at making Star Wars, clearly uninterested in being a truthful media outlet in true journalistic fashion, responded by subsequently blocking Borg. Brian Borg tweeted again, stating, At Making Star Wars made it very clear that they were not interested in proof when they posted their story attacking Give Us Legends, when they blocked me for one tweet trying to correct them. They showed they weren't interested in truth either. I don't want this to happen to any others. Here is proof. He then posted a screenshot of the blocked tweet you just saw. Give Us Legends posted its last press release on the subject referencing Brian Borg's tweets to MakingStarWars.net, imploring them to correct their error. As many of you are already aware, yesterday a story was published on the internet that implicated that Give Us Legends and the Alliance to Preserve the Expanded Universe, among others, were behind an effort to bully Kelly Marie Tran, an actress from the recent Star Wars films. As we have already stated, the involvement of any Expanded Universe movement page or group, including the Give Us Legends, in such an activity is 100% false. Brian Borg, current president of Twin Sons Foundation and individual who was the campaign administrator for our Billboard project, attempted to politely correct the publishers of the stories, making Star Wars, on Twitter yesterday. After one tweet, he was blocked, an action which proved that the news entity was not interested in telling the truth. While Give Us Legends is about obtaining the continuation of Star Wars Legends timeline, it is also a proponent of creating a positive influence in the Star Wars community and beyond. This is one of the reasons why it essentially became Twin Suns Foundation, an entity that now focuses on getting Star Wars books into children's hospitals, public libraries, and other similar places. For the same reason, Brian shared with Twitter this morning images of his tweet, which he tried to get Making Star Wars to correct their story, and a screenshot of him being blocked by Making Star Wars. Brian is not asking anyone to attack Making Star Wars, as that will only add to more problems in the, commu in the community. Instead, he is asking everyone to spread the word that particular news entity is not interested in the truth. That's what I'm doing right now, if you can't fucking tell. He hopes that this is that this will prevent them from causing problems for others in the future, and it will result in less negative atmosphere in the community in the future. Here is a link to his tweet this morning. Most of us didn't even know who Kelly Marie Tran was before the scandal. While everyone else is watching the Disney Star Wars movies, our heads are buried in our EU books. We honestly don't care what's going on in the new canon. We just want our old canon continued alongside it as an equally valid alternate timeline. That's the point I'm really trying to drive home here. The sad part is, we are still getting harassed as a result of this. The Twin Sons Foundation, which is run by the Give Us Legends movement, is a charity organization that raises money to buy Star Wars Legends books to give to kids in intensive pediatric care. And it's not uncommon to see these heartless people leave insensitive comments and reviews on their Facebook page. I'm sorry, and excuse my language and my earlier language, but who the fuck harasses a charity organization? Who the fuck harasses an actress for a role she merely only played? What kind of soulless and sensitive animal thinks this shit is fucking okay? People nowadays are a lot more ballsy in with what comes out of their mouths, especially now that everybody has a screen that they can cower behind. And I bet half of these people wouldn't be saying this shit if they had to say it to their faces. Grow the fuck up, people! We were not involved with bullying Kelly Marie Tran. We are not a troll group. The Give Us Legends movement does not and has never and will never condone bullying. All statements and articles that I've read here are linked in the description of this video because unlike Jason Ward from MakingStarWars.net, I actually do my research and want you guys to do your own research too if you don't trust mine. Another misconception, they're all fat, white, straight, alt-right men living in their parents' basements. And man, are they just hitting the wrong marks today. 
People from all walks of life enjoy Star Wars Legends. Legends has something to offer everyone, seeing that the original expanded universe had every bit of diversity that the Disney canon does, maybe even more. We have diverse characters of different ethnicities. We have tons of strong female characters. We have LGBT characters. So naturally, there are people of all different ethnicities, lifestyles, and views that are part of the Give Us Legends movement. I have seen radically different political views, from right-leaning to left-leaning within the group. I have seen straight and gender fluid, and we've all managed to get along just fine. Our love for the expanded universe is what brings us together, in fact, because inside the Give Us Legends movement, we are all Star Wars fans, no matter what. Where outside, we're not, because we're ostracized and shunned by those who go with the agenda of Disney Lucasfilm. We are not Star Wars fans in the eyes of those who own Star Wars, and it's frankly quite tragic when you think about it. Contrary to popular belief, the first canonically confirmed gay Star Wars character was from the Star Wars Expanded Universe, Goran Bavine, a Mandalorian of all people. Not from Chuck Wendig's aftermath, as modern-day Lucasfilm likes to boast. So naturally, we have a healthy LGBTQ community within the Give Us Legends movement as well. There are even new canon fans within the Give Us Legends movement. Like I stated earlier in the video, these people are fans that enjoy Disney Lucasfilm's new canon, but have a healthy respect for the expanded universe, and want to see it continued alongside the new canon as an alternate timeline. Last misconception about the Give Us Legends movement is that they support a boycott of all Disney Star Wars movies and products. Quite the contrary. See, we want to buy Star Wars products. We are chomping at the bit to buy Star Wars products. But Disney Lucasfilm isn't making Star Wars products we want to buy. It's simple supply and demand. If you won't supply us New Legends content, we won't buy it. We have no interest in the new canon. Therefore, why would we buy it? We've tried to get them to publish more books. We went as far as to raise money to put up a billboard. And we put up that damn billboard! Right near Lucasfilm's offices, so Kathleen Kennedy was forced to look at it every damn day she drove into work. And we were labeled as terrorists for putting up a simple billboard! I mean, come on! If you seriously equate a bunch of dedicated fans putting up a billboard to try to get Lucasfilm to bring the old Star Wars back as a separate timeline, to religious fanatics blowing up a building that kills or wounds hundreds, you seriously need to reanalyze your mental state. We tried to get Legends action figures as well, but when Ben Skywalker, who is the son of Luke Skywalker in the EU, won the nomination for the 2017 fan-requested Hasbro Black Series figure, they falsely accused us of cheating in the fan poll with no viable evidence, and removed him from the list subsequently. They eventually threw us a bone and made a Jaina Solo Hasbro Black Series figure, who is the daughter of Han and Leia in the EU, and we all clamored to buy it! We even did a massive pre-order campaign to show Disney Lucasfilm, where they look most, their wallets, that we want Legends! We're gonna do the same thing when the original Clone Wars series-themed Obi-Wan Kenobi figure becomes available for pre-order next year, to again! Show Disney where they look most, their wallets, that we want Legends! Do we generally look to buy Expanded Universe novels and comics without the Legends banner? Yes, but that's because of two reasons. One, they're more valuable to collectors without the Legends banner, and two, we don't want to be constantly reminded that what we were told was Star Wars for 37 years is no longer. We do end up buying these media with the Legends banner on them anyways, because A, it's hard to find non-used copies of EU novels without the Legends banner, and B, because it helps the cause of getting Legends continued by giving money to Disney Lucasfilm only for Legends stuff. So you see, we aren't boycotting Star Wars, we're only buying Legends books and toys, because Legends is Star Wars to us.
I have said this in my previous videos. You can take all of the evidence that I have presented before you and dismiss it if you wish. You are entitled to your beliefs just as I am entitled to mine. You can believe whatever propaganda Disney-owned Lucasfilm wants you to believe. However, that does not, I repeat, does not give you license to bully other fans for their preferences and denounce them for liking what was just as canon as what you like. Same goes for the few EU fans out there who get riled up by the new canon fans and their ignorant ramblings, because you know the truth does not give you license to bully them for what they like either. Be the bigger person. If you must respond, respond in a calm manner, with carefully backed up facts, and never resort to childish name calling, even if they do first. Am I saying that you absolutely need to stop hating Legends and give it a chance? That would be nice, but no. All I'm saying here is that the common reasons for all the EU slash Legends hatred is for the most part false, making the hatred unnecessary and counter-progressive if this franchise has any shred of hope left. Ask yourself this question. What negative effect does the Legends timeline being continued as an alternate, equally valid timeline have on me as a fan or on the Star Wars stories I like? The answer, in all reality, is absolutely none. Lucasfilm will still make movies in the new canon continuity. New canon comics, books, and video games will continue to be produced. The only difference will be that there's another timeline that you don't have to follow if you don't want to that will have new books published within it every so often, bringing the fans who left back in 2014 back into the fold. It's nothing but beneficial for Disney Lucasfilm as well. Bringing Legends back will bring back the fans who lost interest after their stories were abruptly discontinued. Publishing Legends books and manufacturing other Legends products will get Legends fans buying things again and overall just more money for Disney Lucasfilm. It's a whole untapped market of Star Wars fans that they are too stubborn to utilize. There is this whole chunk of their target audience that they are outright refusing to market to. They are only utilizing a portion of their whole market that they could be, which makes no sense from any economic standpoint whatsoever. And nothing for nothing, what the fans who weren't happy about the sequel trilogy and the handling of Luke Skywalker and Han Solo's character in that trilogy failed to realize is that if Legends is continued, they'll have a whole other universe to follow where Luke is alive and succeeds in reviving the Jedi Order, where Han Solo is alive, still married to Leia with three kids. But, because of this misinformation about Star Wars Legends perpetuated by Disney Lucasfilm and proponents of their agenda, they already have these preconceived notions about the EU in their heads, all based on complete lies and mistruths. Continuing Legends isn't admitting defeat with the new canon. It's coming to terms with the mistake of throwing away nearly 40 years of story material instead of utilizing it properly. And I don't mean just cherry-picking story elements, characters, organizations, vehicles, and planets from Legends like they've been doing. I mean continuing it as its own separate continuity. With any luck, we will have our expanded universe back as a fully reorganized alternate timeline, existing alongside the Disney canon, for all to enjoy and get fans back into the fold. It's beneficial for Disney Lucasfilm, it's beneficial for the fandom, and we will fight till the last EU advocate drops dead. I sincerely hope that the more open-minded people watching this video leave with a better outlook and understanding on the Expanded Universe and the Expanded Universe fandom. We are not the fandom menace, as Disney Lucasfilm likes to label all those who don't like their movies or disagree with their policies. We are Star Wars fans just like you, only our Star Wars is a little bit different. Thank you for taking the enormous chunk of time out of your day to watch this video. If you are interested in the Expanded Universe slash Legends and want to know more about what the Star Wars universe was like before 2014, go on over to my primary channel, Manda Lore. And if you like what you see, click like and subscribe. Thank you.